Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Well, Brad, Evan's corrupted us both. I have. We've both caved. And now spent the 30 minutes before this podcast, which we should have just started recording, talking about golf. Yeah, I forgot how much I liked golf. I miss it. I'm not good at it, but I miss it. It's an abusive lover, that's for sure. Nothing ruins a good walk quite like a game of golf. (laughs) To our listeners, I'm sorry that we let Evan win. Uh, But those of you who are smart saw this coming five years ago. Um, I've had to, you know, unbookmark Craigslist and Kijiji from my browser. So I would stop keeping an eye out for, uh, used clubs. I've had to stop pricing out clubs because I am not nearly good enough for that. Um, and so now all three of us are going to have to keep golf talk to a minimum. Long story short, Brad went out in the middle of the sun, middle of the day today. How are you not burnt to a crisp? Uh, because I've been burnt so many times this summer, I have just become one with the crispy. <laughs> crispy and that, and I put on like a, a mountain of sunscreen before I left the house today. Uh, I got my bag secondhand off someone, and I reached in one day, and he had a uh, coin purse. Is that common on golf courses, Evan, to have a little coin purse? No. No. He had, he had a coin purse full of like, you know. Coins? Coins. Good coins. <laughs> valuable coins and uh, a big bottle of uh suntan lotion i haven't used that once yeah there's a lot of questions that i have <laughs> but i'm not sure i want the answers to them you found I mean, money and lotion this uh <laughs> <laughs> i think the golf bag eager. was just an excuse it's a nice bag too why do you give it to me for 20 bucks hey that's how much i bought my first one for it's great Things awesome it has that. I, I thought it was like novel. It had that has that those little stands where it, you lean on it and it kicks the legs out. Yeah, it's pretty universal. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I was like, oh, state of the art. What a my feature. Bag, my bag doesn't have that. Mine is flat on the ground while I am hitting. Oh, pff. I was gonna say like, and you look at Evans. Evans like rolls it out, out rolls it. Mine's out, like the back makes him a drink. It yeah. just follows <laughs> me. Jeez, a drink, Christ. Evan. It's also his caddy. Is like uh, 174 yards and then it hooks, right? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, calculating the air pressure and the wind resistance before I shoot. So I know how to shank it into the woods. <laughs> well, anyways, we are not going to talk about golf because uh, the world of hockey has been. It's just been weird. The world's been weird. What a, <laughs> what a weird time, you know. So welcome to the Winged Wheel podcast. Uh the Detroit Red Wings podcast that brings you all the weirdness in the world of <laughs> Red Wings and hockey. And I we're going to get into the first topic here. And I don't I just don't even know. I've never been at a bigger loss for words. But until then, for now, let's segue in. I'm Ryan Hanna. I let Pavel out of the monastery. <laughs> and I'm Evan. Um. There's going to be a few things we're going to talk about today. Uh, Return to play, of course. Uh, We're going to talk about some just, you know, Red Wings related stuff. Um, We're going to do our prospect preview and and play in preview and and goings on around the league. But I don't think we can do anything other than address the (laughs) first thing here, which is uh, the news that news or story that broke about Pavel Datsuk over the past couple days, which is, and I want to pull up the exact headline here. Um, I don't even know how to. It was, if it was any other year, it would be a lot more uh, surprising, but it is certainly a weird headline. Yeah. I didn't even know how to react to that. Okay. Okay. The level of apathy I had towards that headline is <laughs> is truly <laughs> damning as to how bad 2020 has been. It's just like, yeah, whatever, who cares? Smile I'm going to read the on. I'm going to read the headline and Brad is so right. I read that and I just went, "Oh my god." The headline read and this was from uh RT and I don't 
really know how reliable the source is. I've had a few different people telling me that's not generally a reliable source, but this isn't the kind of thing that it would typically make up. That's usually more political stuff. Regardless, the, the headline reads, ex-NHL star Datsuk, in quotations here, hold up at monastery defended by Cossacks with priest who claims COVID is a cover-up to microchip the population. <clears throat> oh my there's a lot to unpack in just that headline <laughs> <laughs> uh well now's a good time to announce a seven part uh spin-off mini series as we dive into that headline and that headline alone each volume containing four hours of just brad screaming <laughs> um okay our, our new game what is pavel datsik doing inside the monastery uh, Things we can think of probably aren't even in the realm of real. He is building a trabucket to launch bricks at 5G towers. He's building a what? Trabucket, the launcher. <laughs> it's a trebuchet, right? <laughs> right, right. No. What not... is a catapult? <laughs> I'll go with catapult. <laughs> Very different things. And there's a big contingent of people online who will come after you if you say a catapult and a trebuchet are the same thing. But no, it's... It, uh, I don't give a shit what it is. We're talking what? about a uh, hockey player, air quotations, hold up at a monastery that we don't even know if it's true because that's not even getting into the things the priest is into. But yeah. It, uh, well, it was formerly known as a trebuchet, but now henceforth will be known as a trebucket. Um, it sounds that's more a good English. Theory. <laughs> okay, b- before we before we give this too much, you know, credence, we have to pull up uh, some counterpoints that were made. Uh, Dan Milstein, um, P- Datsuk's agent, put out a tweet to say Pavel Datsuk is currently at his cottage with his family, with like a one point four second clip of. Uh, presumably Datsuk, you can't see his face, but it looks like him swinging an axe and chopping a piece of firewood. And then the clip just cuts. And my first thought was, all right, I didn't exactly trust the initial headline that he was at this monastery. Just inherently, like I was a little skeptical of that. Uh, but I think he would have been better off just tweeting that out without the weird video that proves like essentially nothing. Did, yeah. did he? I don't even think in tweet he even said specifically that he's not there i don't think that was mentioned is his cottage in the monastery like <laughs> like i don't know it was and then like apparently the back of datsuk's shirt had some like positive message like we can all do this together but or something like that i don't know if that's the actual translation i don't speak russian but someone said it and it's like okay i get what you're doing literally just release a statement that says no I would have understood that more. Your description, Brad, earlier was was dead on. It's just apathy. Like my first reaction was whether this is true or not. I am just so tired. <laughs> like I'm just so tired that I know I should have a larger, more like, substantial reaction to this. And all I thought was, oh, you know, who can be suppressed? I was just read it. And I was like, that's weird. Kind of just yeah. moved on after that. What can you do? Are you really going to say in 2020 this is the most shocking thing to happen? This wasn't the most shocking thing to happen yesterday, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm not going to I'm going to wait a little bit longer to see what's happening here. Um, but frankly, I don't care. I just like it's I can't bring myself to care. We'll talk about it. I'm sure if, if some if news comes out more one way or the other and that might be crappy of me to say. And, you know, I, I'm, I might be just trying to avoid the truth here. But that Zook doesn't play for this team anymore. And there's too much else going on in the world right now. I can't possibly care about this. If I would, not right now, you know, I wouldn't care about it if it wasn't so hilarious. Honestly. It, we've we've craved and begged for content and the the hockey gods just go do with this chaos what you will like he he's joined a cult allegedly it's always so weird getting any information from Datsu because he's generally he doesn't speak english very well he's generally pretty reserved most answers that are the most candid or substantial things that are uh do come from him are like you know you have to essentially pry it out of him and then Anything that he does speak candidly to was in Russian initially, and you don't know the the quality of the source that's reporting on that or the translation. And it's like, 
I don't feel like I know anything about Datsuk the person and, at all. And, and that's like he is such a weird breed. I will never forget the t- after the 2008 Stanley Cup. And you know how CBC does that uh montage of all the players saying where they're from and who their favorite player was growing up. It said, "Hi, I'm pa-. it's like, "Hi, I'm Pavel Datsuk. I'm from name I can't pronounce in Russia and I don't have a favorite player." <laughs> like who doesn't have a favorite player? Chris Chelios big dick butt kiss for takes. I, I just Come play on. hockey. Yar- who is it? Yarmer Yager picked himself, I think, the one year. <laughs> like, I think that was a serious answer, too. Like, oh, my God, Pav. And then anytime they asked him about anything non-hockey related, he just always gave non-answers. He could be a mole person for all we know. He doesn't give us anything. And if he was holed up at a Russian monastery in a place where they're not letting people in or out, yada, 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 because that's what hold up means, how would anybody know he's there? Nobody says anything. And who really cares, to be honest? Like, he is allowed to do whatever he wants on his own free time, just like everybody else who goes to work. As yeah, long as it's I mean, not interfering with your work and you're not being a total menace to society, I don't care. Yeah, but a, a conspiracy theory, you know, a COVID conspiracy theory, religious zealot who has control like control over a large swath of the population who could end up causing harm, that's a lot more substantial. Well, he's not the guy who played for the Red Wings. <laughs> no. Well, at least I don't think he did. I mean, you never know. You never know point. who's under that beard. Oh, that yeah, guy. Datsuk pulls off a mask. It's just this old Rasputin dude. So pretty much the headline is Datsuk purportedly holed up with uh, 5G COVID rambling rasputin and i haven't seen anything to corroborate it and uh like brad said we only have a select amount of energy to put into the bullshit headlines of 2020 any given day so we're gonna wait to see how this one plays out or doesn't i don't know maybe i don't know maybe he's at his cottage we all saw that 1.4 second clip of him swinging an axe which proved a lot of things you know it proved that he conclusively he's not at a monastery his cottage where also because I know the guy loves Michigan like he loved hunting and fishing in Michigan so are they here right now no he couldn't be here the borders are closed the whole optics of having that video is very peculiar like why would his agent have that video sent to him from someone around Pavel Datsuk so or is he with Pavel Datsuk so who knows Dan (laughs) Milstein With how private and Pavel and like how Pavel operates and how weird Pavel is, it wouldn't surprise me to find out Pavel just doesn't know how to use his cell phone. So I like to picture in my head Milstein on the phone with like his wife or daughter or something like in broken English is like, just take the video. Just take him. What's he doing? He's chopping wood. I don't care. Take the video. That is what it looks like, right? It's like a live photo. That's why it's so short. (laughs) Uh... I, I know like I know there's a part of us that's supposed to be taking this more seriously, but I just like we're not primed for that right now. You know what? <laughs> it's been a what long part of that headline can you take seriously? <laughs> twenty twenty has been a long, long decade, and uh, we have to pick our hills to die on. And some of them are great, and some of them, you know, we have to to walk away from. And for now, for this battle, we're gonna walk away from it. Uh so let's walk, let's discuss a different travesty happening a little bit closer to home uh an update on our uh one of our favorite floundering franchises that we talked about a little while back which is the buffalo sabers <clears throat> whoa uh not too long ago jason botterill was confirmed to be returning as gm uh have still having the confidence of the pagulas who own the sabers <clears throat> and your uh, buffalo bills brad uh in the last three days they have fired everyone yeah, that uh, drive I hit on 10 wasn't the only nuke to go off this week. Yeah, for real. Uh, Botterill's gone. Uh, I think 23 people in total, like most of the scouting department, is gone. Before the draft. Before the draft. Like a few months before the draft. Which is insane. So I, I know you hate when I do it, but I, I have to talk because it's relevant about this. Because the Pagoulas have been taking a lot of heat for this, and deservedly so. But I can't fathom how dysfunctional the sabers are 
Because if you go into the football world, the Bills are the model organization right now. Great coach, great team, great GM. Everything top down is running tip top, just like the air quotations, perfect organization right now. And literally the same owners, you jump over sports and they are. If nobody is more thankful for Eugene Melnick than Terry Pagula, because they would be the most dysfunctional organization in the NHL. It is staggering. You fire your GM three weeks after Kim Pagula was on record, backing him up, saying he's our GM of the future. So something happened in those three weeks. They appointed Kevin Adams right away. No GM search. Never been a GM before, but has worked with the Bagulas for 10 years. So clearly they had a level of comfort with him, which is probably their thing. You're in the middle of the weirdest draft season ever, and you let most of your scouts go. And like, it's not like Buffalo's drafted poorly. They've done, for the most part, I'd say, all right. They haven't been any better or worse than any other team off the top of my head. They got, even if you go outside of the first round, Uko Pekalukadin and Victor Olofsson seem like uh, amazing picks, like way better than you're ever going to do outside of the first round in any given draft, especially when you consider Olofsson was a seventh rounder. Um, There were rumors going around that it was because the Pagulas wanted to spend less and Botterill wasn't having any of that. But I just, something had to have happened to do this now it's uh, involved owners are never like almost universally a bad thing in sports almost universally like unless they grew up and are just one of those random combinations of like mega billionaire which you have to be to own a a major sports franchise right now and uh, like embedded in the game it just doesn't go well i'm sorry the the pagula seem like nice people i don't know much about them that they're not they did not – they're not – they don't know hockey. Like, it's just so evident that they don't know hockey. And that's okay. You don't have to know hockey to be an owner. But that's when you appoint a GM or president of hockey operations to oversee the GM and you take their word for it. And you manage them as people and manage them from a business aspect to say, hey, here's what I need from the business. Talk to me. Translate hockey into something I can understand. And then you go from there. I don't – really get the owners taking such an involved role in hiring a GM. You know, if you sat either one of the Pagulas in a room with nobody to help them out and ask them questions about the sport of hockey, how much would they be able to answer from a GM's level, not even from a fan's level, from a GM's level? It is hard to be a front office professional in the NHL. It is so hard to be a GM of an NHL team. And I'm not saying Jason Botterill should have stayed i think they should have fired him but does this seem like they are cleaning out house to do this properly or does this seem like what you said brad where it's some silly reason where they just didn't want to spend the money and the fact that they didn't even do a proper gm search and just appointed someone from within it kind of reeks of kevin adams saying like hey kevin are you gonna do what we say and spend to an internal cap and he goes yep please give me my first ever gm job and bam, Kevin Adams is now GM of the Buffalo Sabres. I think there is a, a lot of that involved in this. But this is one of those things that I think because of how big it was that a lot of the reasons are going to get overthought. Because when when in reality, the Buffalo Sabres is a business. The Pagulas own them to make money. No other reason. Yeah, it's a fun way to make money, but they need to make money. How do you make money in the NHL? You win. The Buffalo Sabres don't win. They need to start winning to make money. The last time the Buffalo Sabres made the playoffs, Nick Lidstrom and the Atlanta Thrashers were in the NHL. Whoa. So nobody can blame the Pagulas for saying this is crap. Now, they've went through, I think, three GMs and like six head coaches in the time that they've owned the Buffalo Sabres, which isn't that long. And let's not forget when they came in, though, they were willing to spend. They threw all the money in the world at Vili Leno and Christian Erhoff. They signed off on those contracts, no problem. And that's not their fault that their GM signed those bad contracts. GM goes, hey, good players, big money. They go, okay, we'll sign the check. Um, Because again, like you said, they don't know anything about hockey. They had to take the GM's word for it. So 
I, I think what it comes down to is they're probably losing money on this organization because they're losing and they've How been do you losing lose money in Buffalo. They're nuts for hockey there. Because well, they don't sell out because they lose. They suck. It's like the Red Wings now. We the building was packed for the home opener. Didn't stay packed for long when people saw what the product was. The same thing happens in Buffalo. And again, because I follow a ton of Bill's stuff right now. And according to just about every beat writer, reporter, whoever covers the Bills that I follow, the Pagulas are hands off with football decisions. Brandon Bean has basic autonomy to do whatever the hell he wants. But why can he do that? The Bills are winning. The Bills are set up to be one of the best teams in the NFL for the next five years. Of course, they're going to be hands off because guess what? The Bills are good. They sell out every game. They're making a ton of money on that side of the business. So I'm not going to sit here and say that the Pagulas have been flawless owners. They haven't. They traded their employees like garbage when the COVID stuff happened. They have fought. They don't give their GMs enough time to do a good job. They've had a coaching turnstile. They can't hire hockey people to save their lives, which is probably why Kevin Adams got it, because they know who he is and at least have some trust in him. It all comes down to money. And in hockey, money comes down to winning. And the Sabres don't do it. And they had enough. Well, um, it really is nice for us because we can kind of sit back and think as bad as Red Wings fans have had it over the past five years, it's and as prolonged as the Red Wings rebuild has been, it's really like not even close to the bottom tier of how bad stuff can get because they have um, a GM with an excellent track record now managing this rebuild in, in Steve Eisenman. Um, there haven't been terrible anchor contracts signed in a long time um granted those are still on the books but you can't do anything about that once they're signed they're signed and slowly but surely the rebuild is happening meanwhile you have other teams where they're either had the best players in the league like ottawa and their ownership just you know pissed them away or you have the sabers who somehow has one of the best player the one of the best centermen of his probably by the time it's all said and done of his generation and Jack Eichel and can't build a team around him. And they have the, not the leadership to guide them through this. Ottawa might actually end up there haphazardly. It's like that gift of the elephant, you know, pooping itself and falling into the pool accidentally. Um, if they get, you know, Lafreniere and uh, Lafreniere and Stutzler or something, this draft, but Buffalo and Ottawa just really scream. It can get so much worse. And that's a and nice little juxtaposition. Buffalo is, in my mind, is really on the clock with Jack Eichel. Oh, yeah. He's very vocal publicly about his frustration with the team, whether that be the other players or uh, head coaches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At some point, he could just say, I'm not playing for this team anymore. There's, yeah. you can tell his compete means more than the place he's at, uh, or the team he plays for. Two years, we could see Jack Eichel just throwing in the towel and saying, "You got to trade me. I need to win somewhere else because it's not happening here." Which is just, sh- which is a shame because I think Buffalo is starting to find those building blocks. But if those building blocks don't turn into what we think they will be, there'll be teams lining up for his contract. I'm I'm happy you brought up the Eichel thing on a clock because uh, first, before I get into my point, to all of you that have been tweeting at me, could the Red Wings trade for Eichel next year if he gets fed up? Sure. In theory, yeah, but he hasn't even asked for a trade yet, so I'm not even getting into that. And no, I don't know what it would cost to get Eichel, and the answer is probably way more than you're comfortable giving up. But... <laughs> There's it is funny because arguably right now there's no three organizations in the NHL in worse shape than Ottawa, Detroit and Buffalo. You could make a case for San Jose, but it's funny how all three are so different right now. The Red Wings are the worst team. Ottawa is the worst ownership um, and Buffalo is the most mismanaged. But here's the thing. Ottawa has a plan. It's not a good plan, but they have a plan. Sell everything, get infinity picks, and then if we throw enough darts, it's going to get good. And to a lot, and in a lot of ways, it looks like it's working. In eight days, it's going to pay off (laughs) big time. Yeah, like they went full nuclear, which has its downsides, 
But like they have seven picks in the first two rounds of this very deep draft. Their scouting department would have to fail royally for them to not come out of this like shining. Um, the Red Wings are the worst team in the NHL and have a very defined plan. The Buffalo Sabres have no plan. Are they rebuilding? Are they not? Are they contenders? Are they treading water? Because Kim Pagula said they're not rebuilding. And part of me looks at the rosters and go, are that roster and goes, are you kidding me? But at the same time, I look at that roster, see Jack Eichel and go, well, yeah, you can't waste Jack Eichel. So can you really rebuild right now? Because by the time you do a full and proper rebuild, yeah, Eichel's contract's almost up and he ain't going to stick around for a rebuild. So they don't have a plan. They are throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks right now, which is the worst thing you can do. Because as bad as San Jose was this year, they had a plan. Their plan was working. Up until this year, they were perennial contenders, and now it's imploding in their face because their team got old. It happens. They can adjust course, and I'm sure Doug Wilson will have a new plan within the next year. But yeah, and and I almost can't blame anybody for the Sabres' lack of a plan, except for the Pagulas. Because when you have that many coaches and that many GMs, how can anyone establish a thing? The Red Wings could be the worst team in the league, historically bad, Again, for the next two seasons. And I don't think any Red Wings fan would really complain about Eisman because we know we have the plan. We're terrible. We need to get younger, better, get picks, develop prospects. Okay, we're on board. We get it. And nobody's going to blame. But if Buffalo tanks the next two years, they won't have the same reaction. It's sad because we're almost at a point in the NHL where it's more preferable for teams to be owned by giant conglomerates or like multinational corporations like Comcast or, you know, MLSC, which is just a massive, massive group or things like that, where like Comcast isn't going to say like the CEO of Comcast isn't going to be like, oh, yeah, I, I want to get in the nitty gritty of the flyers and, and do this and that. They're going to appoint people. They're going to hire people, hockey ops people like a president of hockey operations or something of the sort within the Flyers organization that is the bridge between the the company and the team, but they're not going to dive into it. Like it's, you're not gone are the days where these owners are like, I call them small owners. These people, (laughs) they own almost a billion dollar franchise. Yeah. These people made, made more money since we started talking on this podcast and we're going to make in our entire lives combined. Well, maybe not Evan. Evan is secretly a billionaire, but me and you, Brad. Um, but it's like, I, I just don't understand. Like, like Brad said, if you're going to hire and fire that many coaches and GMs, at some point you take responsibility for your staff's transgressions. If I'm at work and one of my staff member messes up repeatedly and I hired and fired or I hired them and I brought them on, I'm taking the heat for that. You, of course, dish it to them and say, hey, you shouldn't have done that or you did this and that wrong. But when you report to your boss or you report to, you know, your stakeholders or you report to your <laughs> earnings or you report to the fans if you're the Pagulas, you have to say, yeah, that's that's my fault. I, I hired the wrong person. And it's like they said, oh, it just didn't align with our vision. Shouldn't that be an interview question? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the first thing they ask you? What are you bringing to this job? What are your goals? What do you where do you see yourself in five years? And uh, it's vision. And and it's funny too, because again, things can be overly simplified. I forget what coach it was, but I remember Friedman telling a story about a team was interviewing uh actually I think it was Quenville in Florida. They were interviewing him, and Quenville's first question is, What's the goalie situation? Because if you don't have it, you're walking into a dead end. Yeah. Again, I mentioned it a couple episodes ago with Buffalo. Uh, what's their goalie situation? Yeah, because if they think Carter Hutton's the answer, it ain't it. And Uka Pekalukinen's still probably a couple years away. So. Apparently, uh, Carter Hutton uh, had eye surgery or something to fix some eye issues, so he'll actually be able to see this year. So that's good. That's good. Now like, it'll uh, kind of need uh, that as a goalie. That's like James help. Winston. Did James the, uh... Winston got LASIK. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Christ. Hey, thir- 30 INT is 30 TDs. Hey, I wasn't playing with my glasses on. What do you expect? <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have ate that popcorn. Just throwing it up. But, yeah, I kind yeah. of fit, you know, you think about having an, like a single point of ownership, such as a, 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 it's kind of a double edged sword because on the one, f- one f- side, you've got someone who's clearly passionate about the sport and passionate about the team, and they have that fan perspective. And they're willing to 
push the team, push the purse strings to to make a competitive team. But the other hand, you have all of that and they think from a fan perspective, not a hockey ops perspective. Uh-huh. And they act as another cook in the kitchen when they really have no qualification to do it other than they're rich. Yeah. You said Carter Hutton had a LASIK surgery. Did that also fix his six foot one problem? Uh, uh, I, you yeah, know that's I, tiny for an NHL goalie these depend, days. Depends what month. Sometimes they've got the two for one deals or buy one, <laughs> get one 50. Shin extensions. Oh, man. Uh, we'll move on here and uh, talk a little bit. I don't know. I keep we keep kicking the can on on discussing uh, different like evergreen Red Wings topics that we have all season to talk about. So maybe we'll move on from that now and and let's get into uh, let's get into play in series preview. Um, our series for today, the best of five, not the playoffs, but actually playoffs, but really not playoff series, is uh, Minnesota versus Vancouver, which is honestly primed to be either absolutely boring as hell or complete feast like amazing series that nobody was expecting um i'm gonna go with likely boring because vancouver's strength is their goaltending markstrom had damn near an mvp season this year and i don't know how many people noticed that uh demko is a capable backup if markstrom doesn't come back from his injury tip top Minnesota's not a highly offensive team, so a not highly offensive team going into a hot goalie. Uh, yeah, my hope is that uh, Elias Pettersson and Brock Besser just go off and Zach Parise and Eric Stahl and company and Kevin Fiala, who's actually super fun to watch, uh, keep up. That is what I'm hoping for. That is not what I'm betting on. Yeah, the more I look at this and you look at the the game breaking potential of Vancouver's superstars um, and the fact that their goalie can steal a game on any given night, I would be as a fan happy if Minnesota walked out of this with one game. I have Vancouver taking this 3-1. It will be fun to watch uh, Elias Pettersson in some kind of playoff scenario. Um, Always is fun watching the best players in the game playing the best hockey possible uh same with quinn hughes you know brock besser markstrom again who's very underrated in terms of league mvp won't get the kind of recognition that he deserves um but at the same time doesn't matter if he can win this series for the canucks that's all he'll care about minnesota was pretty how far down the totem pole were they in terms of these like outside teams being brought in not that far i think they were they were hot when the the whole thing stopped who knows? I mean, Minnesota has come back from a 3-1 deficit in a series against Vancouver before. So you never know. Um, but I, everybody knows my thoughts on how to win in the NHL right now. You get a good goalie and you get and you ride your superstars. It's a superstar driven league. Uh, Devin Dubnik might be the most overrated goalie in the NHL in my mind. Jack Markstrom, probably the most underrated. <laughs> and the Canucks I think have Staylock is their starter right now because Dubnik was so bad. That's probably the right choice. And uh, Stalock also isn't that good. Um, so you got the goaltending matchup in my mind heavily in favor of Vancouver because I'd probably take Demko over either of Minnesota's goalies and he's the backup. And I think there's only one true and legitimate superstar in this series and that's Elias Pettersson. Not that uh, Brock Besser or Quinn Hughes are far off. Um, I give Minnesota a heavy, uh, not a heavy, but I give them an advantage, a sizable advantage on defense. And Vancouver's top six is unreal. Their bottom six is a travesty. But I still give Vancouver the edge on offense. Um, I don't want to say 3-1 Vancouver because they're Vancouver and they'll Vancouver this up. But I am going to take the Canucks in five. To Vancouver, Evan, how about you? Yeah, if all things are considered equal, which they might be coming out of the break, I still think I still like Vancouver because they're a younger team, and it's a little bit easier for those younger bodies to uh, to get back in the swing of things. Um, it's probably still snowing in Minnesota, so uh, <laughs> it might be tough for some of those older bodies to to get up to game speed. So I, with all those things said. Uh, I, I think Vancouver's got it. 
I'll give Minnesota a game. It's best of five, right? For this yep. one? Yep. Yeah, I give Minnesota a game just because this is a coin flip league. So we'll say 3 1 Vancouver. Um, did you guys see what Kevin Bieksa said on uh, Tim and Sid? I'm uh, sure it was highly intellectual. Uh, definitely did not see that. He said, uh, honestly, half the guys that I've talked to don't even want to play. They think that the season should just be called and start fresh in the fall. I Do mean, you blame I... any of them? No. No, and uh, so there's an interesting thing going on. I think I saw an article on it. I forget who it was written by. But basically, one thing that a lot of NHL players do is they time their pregnancies because they don't want to have a child in the middle of a playoff run in the middle of a season. So they aim for the off season. Well, the off season this year is when they're going to be gone, quarantined away from their family or with their family in a quarantined area um, in the middle of a time where nobody ever wants to go to the hospital because COVID's everywhere. So a lot of players are pushing back against playing because, yeah, I don't want to miss the birth of my child because I'm holed up at some casino in Las Vegas while my wife is, you know, however many miles away trying to give birth in one of the worst pandemics we've ever seen. So I I legitimately think we're going to see a lot of players bowing out of this because no, they're not forced to play and they don't get paid for playoffs, which is what I think a lot of people need to remember here. They're not going to be getting paid for this. They got a check, right? Not for playoffs, not in a what normal about, year. Are there performance bonuses? There are there performance are. bonuses in a lot of contracts, yes. I could have sworn they made like a certain amount of thousand per game. Uh, they might make something, but it's nothing close to what they make during the season. But um, no, yeah, it's not like it's prorated to like McDavid. Yeah, because like no. you, it's not like uh, Pasternak and Larkin make a close to the same amount of money. It's not like Pasternak's going to get more because his team went to the playoffs and Larkin's didn't. Right. So um, I, I think we're going to see a lot more players bow out of these playoffs than I think we realize, because, again, uh, hockey is my life. I love hockey more than anything but my family. But if I was an NHL player and Hank was going to be born in this, zero chance I'm going. None. Absolutely none. I wouldn't even consider it. Uh, yeah, if I'm an NHL player living in the, the life of luxury right now, it would be very, very difficult to get me out of my uh, Muskoka chair on the deck or off the golf course to go back in a rink and get back in shape, like game shape. I'm sure they're all just keeping in some form of shape, but to be at that peak physical level where they're game ready and then have to do it all over again in a couple of months, it would be tough for me to do it. Who's Dallas playing? Uh, nobody. They are. They're out. They're a buy team. Oh, they're a buy. Yes. Um, like they're not in this play-in round. They Roman Polak already said he's not coming back, right? Yeah, he's already signed a three-year contract in the Czech League. I mean, that's different because he's near the end of his career, but it's not going to be uncommon or unheard of to see that kind of thing. Um, and uh, who is it? Um, oh, I, I don't know if he's playing or not, but uh, Nick Felino. I think uh, has has a very young child who's very immunocompromised. So he's going to be in a really tough position because he's the captain of the Blue Jackets. He's one of their top players, but he's also one of the biggest risks um, if he catches COVID. So, yeah, I don't, man, this is like, it, it's easy to make fun of. Oh, it's a hard decision for a guy making $4 million a year. No, he's not getting any extra money and these guys value their family more than anything else. Yeah. This is going to be a very hard decision for a lot of these guys, because I'm sure every one of them is chomping at the bit to get back on the ice, but the, uh, but hockey's not important. And, and they're it, ultra competitive people that the general population just doesn't understand that how that thinking is or how that drives them. It is a tough decision. And, uh, I'm, I can't blame anyone for any of the decisions that they make. Someone uh, someone made a great point online. I can't remember if it was Reddit or Twitter, but they're like, you're, you're getting these teams. You're going to have eight teams who have months or weeks, if not months of preparation and intense protocol only to play two to three meaningful games. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you're if you're the Montreal Canadiens right now, about to run into the buzzsaw that is the Pittsburgh Penguins, are you going to care that much? No, probably not, because again, all the protocols, everything in place, they might travel to Toronto or Vancouver or whatever the hell their hub is, and they might get blown out five one in three straight games. Oh, it's gonna be weird. It's all going to be weird. I'm all sure right. we'll appreciate having hockey back. Oh, There's yeah. a lot of sacrifice going on at all levels for those teams that are involved. Oh, yeah. Dude, um, F1 is racing without fans in the stands, which is obviously much easier. They're in cars and all you have, you like the pit crews are obviously in close quarters, but that's it's different than hockey as a sport. Um, they're coming back in three weeks and I'm over the moon excited i know like we're going to speculate and talk about you know the ins and outs and is this should this happen or not but if hockey does actually come back and they're on the ice i'm going to be glued to the screen i'm going to watch minnesota vancouver like it was the boston vancouver finals from however many years ago oh yeah we're having detailed game breakdowns of every (laughs) game (laughs) the Uh, um the Charles Schwab Invitational, the golf tournament this weekend, was pretty good too, and it didn't have fans. Um, yeah. The players kind of commented that uh, without fans, it's hard for guys to really get rolling and uh, get in a groove and, and really charge the leaderboard because they're used to like having the roar of the crowd get them going. Um, but it still didn't deter from how good that tournament was. And you could hear the players talking to their caddies. It was really interesting. Imagine yeah. being that mentally strong where you need a thousand people watching you golf. I was golfing with three other people. And every time I stepped up to the tee, I kind of wanted to ask them to turn around. Oh, uh, f- <laughs> feeling like Bambi up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, pl- I play with a lot of people I don't know. Um, so the first tee is always like this weird, awkward energy until you hit that. And then if you if it's a good shot, they're like, all right, here we go. But if it's bad, you're like. Oh, no. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's move on to our NHL draft prospect profile here. And today's prospect that we're going to be talking about is Carter Savoy. I hate how he pronounces his name. I thought it was Savoy, but it's Carter Savoy. Brad, take us away. Yeah. So uh, the least interesting of the Savoys, because his brother is a potential first overall pick in 2022, the Shane Wright class. Uh, But Savoy, much like Brendan Brisson that we were talking about last episode, is a really interesting case because of the uh, his dimensions. Again, small forward. Wait for it. (laughs) <laughs> not an above average skater extremely gifted offensively uh playing in a lesser league so i guess uh, the randomizer that i used was just spitting out themes at a time but uh yeah so savoy plays in the ajhl now that's probably a step down from the bchl junior league in canada because he wants to go play ncaa in the states i think he's committed to Denver, but don't quote me on that. Um, put up comic book numbers in the AJHL, although some people think it should have been higher given the quality of that league and how skilled uh, he is. But um, it's it's going to be weird because he doesn't have much of a physical game. Unreal shot, great hockey sense, unreal puck skills, very inconsistent, a bit of we'll call it Noel Gundler syndrome. But uh, yeah, it's... Again, it's hard to judge him based on where he's playing. Not that the AJ is a bad league, but it is not the OHL. It's not the WHL. Uh, probably even a step down from the USHL, honestly. But Carter and, Guylander was uh, drafted from the AJ, AJHL. That's the Red Wings goaltender that they drafted. Uh, and the same team. They both play for Sherwood Park. So if you watched any Guylander this year, for whatever reason, you saw... Uh, Carter Savoy. So, and again, it's not that bad players can't come out of this league. Kale McCarr was drafted out of the AJ. So it's absolutely risk reward there. But who is he as a player? Offensively, he is gross. Uh, I think he had, I don't good quote gross. me. I think he, yeah, good gross. I think he broke 50 goals in this league. Uh, just, he sees the ice really well, 
has a tendency to try to do a bit too much himself. But given the league he plays in, I find that understandable because it's not like he's playing with line mates that are his skill level. So, yeah, it makes sense. He trusts his own skills more than his teammates. But when he does make the passes, he finds the seams. He makes them. It's a strength. Again, his puck handling, unreal. His shot, fantastic. Offensively, he can do it all. It's just, can he do that against tougher competition? And given his size, given his skating, much like the rest of this draft, it seems, I don't know. Um, I I have him probably somewhere in the mid-second round right now, understanding that if we're basing this entirely off his talent level alone, you could absolutely make a case for a late first. So the thing that stands out to me, you know, if you want a Red Wings perspective on this is I don't see a world where the Red Wings target this guy um, purely for the fact that he has a perceived issue with effort, um, a little bit of floating, a little bit of cherry picking, not being so keen to get back to his end of the ice. Um, you couple that with him being not a phenomenal skater and, and you have a guy that really doesn't fit Steve Eisenman's pedigree of what he wants, which is, you know, of course, talent and skill and you want the best player possible, but you want a guy who's going to go out there and give it 100 every single shift at minimum. Um, and if that's an issue with him, then you, if he was, you know, had a lot of other dimensions to his game, uh, then yeah, absolutely. Like if he was a better skater, then I could see them taking a risk. Or if he was a centerman, I could see them taking a risk. But um, as supremely talented as he is, and I think he's like, if you go on his actual just like raw unrefined skills, yeah, this guy should be like, a, I think a mid to late first round pick. Um, he would be worth that, that swing of the bat. But because he does disappear at times, like there's been noted inconsistencies in his game and not the strongest league in the world that gives me enough pause to think i myself don't know if i want to take that risk on a left winger and i'm I, i'm almost positive eiserman is not going to want to with his first couple picks there if he floats to the end of the second or round or into the third then yeah absolutely you you don't want to pass on a guy with that kind of skill but i also don't think he'll go that far he's funny because he fits that archetype of what we talked about which is like brad said Great skater, or sorry, great player offensively, small, not that great of a skater. Um, and yeah, there's a couple other things to his game. The thing is, like compared to the other guys in previous episodes that we've talked about, I think he has one of the highest talent levels. But then once you get the the effort issue in there, is, and is it actually effort? <laughs> We've seen that come and go with prospects. They're, they're seen as lazy players, but in reality, it's just that they skate funny and people think that they're being lazy. Like people always think Mantha is being lazy. And sometimes Mantha does float, but sometimes you're just like, no, he just has a long stride and he's a huge guy. I don't know. He's not like he's a he's a good prospect to watch. Um, I've enjoyed watching when he does have the puck and when he does do something with it. Um, I'm trying not like I don't think he's very high on the Red Wings board. No, I don't know like, if that's crazy to say. Like, like you said, he doesn't check a lot of the boxes that the Red Wings are looking for. But if he's there late second, early third, this is the type of player that you take risks on. In those yeah, if he's there, spots. if he's there in those spots, then I'm actively cheering for them to take him for sure. Yeah, because he's not the type of guy that if he pans out, you're like, oh, great, we got a solid fourth liner here who can kill some penalties for us. We didn't just draft K Christopher. And if you hit on Carter Savoy, you got a top six forward who might run the half wall on your power play. Yeah. Um, prediction as to where he'll go. I don't think high end players like that generally float past the second round. I see him going no later than late second round. Um, I've seen some rankings having him in the first. I don't think that's crazy. I think it'd be a bit more likely if he was a centerman, but I'm also not going to say that it would be um, out of this world, unlikely or even wrong for a team to do that. Like Brad said, if you hit on that kind of talent, that's a pretty big hit. You're looking at a top six player. Um, yeah, I'd say second round is a pretty safe estimate for Carter Savoy. Yeah, his talent level is definitely worth the second round. And again, a lot of teams align with my philosophy of you swing for talent and you pray and yeah especially teams that don't have a first round pick this is the exact type of guy you want to take that risk on because 
I mean, if you're if all you get out of a draft is a fourth liner, is that really a good draft? So yeah, no, you gotta roll the dice, gamble, and hope he pans out. All right. Uh, anything that we have before we jump into overtime here? Da, 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 da. All right. Midweek episode overtime on this episode is brought to you exclusively by our Patreon supporters as our way of saying thank you for supporting the show. Um, even when hockey's not on, we're coming to you twice a week and that's not possible without them. So thank your local dub dub patron. Uh, we're going to start with TJ Swanson. He says, so every draft, it seems like a couple of picks inside the top 10 to 15 range turn out to be complete busts. Obviously, if everyone knew that, no one would take them. My question is, if you had to guess which prospects in that top 10 to 15 range have, uh, if you had to guess which of the prospects in that range from this year's draft have the highest bust potential? Uh, oh, man, that's tough because I like all of them so much. Um so ignoring Askarov because picking a goalie is basically cheating in the top 10. Uh, the way Cole Perfetti plays, I could see that not translating to the next level. Again, wouldn't bet on it, but I I could absolutely see that. Um, I, I have a weird thing about Holtz. I wouldn't bank on it. I don't even think it's particularly likely. Um but I think he might not turn into as, you know, gifted of a score in the NHL. Like if if he was to bust, that's how it would happen. He wouldn't turn into as gifted of a score in the NHL as he was um, coming up in Sweden. Haskarov is the cheap pick, but it's kind of there, right? Like mm, it's a goaltender. It's voodoo. You have a risk of this guy, like drafting this guy, and then he doesn't do anything until anything he's on his fourth team and he's 31 years old. And finally, he's going to be halfway decent. Again, not something I would bank on. And that's the thing, TJ, you hit it, like you hit the nail on the head there. You can never predict this. Like we're analyzing all these guys, and there's a reason they're ranked as high as they are. Um, and then I, I think there is a chance here that uh, any centerman who's being pulled up the rankings just by virtue of being a center. So you're looking at, you know, um, Connor Zary maybe or Maverick Bork or depending on how you rank those guys, they could be uh, potentials to be kind of nothing for drum picks. Uh, Dave Crisco. <laughs> 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 says what's up nerds it's me red wings legend of 18 games former second round draft pick and style icon dave crisco i've heard a nasty rumor that some low life cut from a team no one has ever heard of imposter has stolen my good name and changed it slightly into some sort of sick joke i've also heard this hack has hijacked some hard-working people's talkie show now look i know imitation is a sincerest form of flattery but this is insulting to my fine name and good looks and is definitely bad for bitcoin furthermore i've been told by an informant named terry that this talkie show masquerades as a hockey podcast but is consistently off topic uses too many swears and the would-be identity thief has the hashtag bad takes please accept this comment as a cease and desist notice to the one named brad crisco stop behind hiding behind someone else's moniker and be your own man with your own name Failure to comply will result in further legal action. I wonder for for new listeners and for listeners maybe who just tune into overtime for the first time, what they think every time Rowan takes a different persona. So this comment's going to sound even dumber. And uh, Ryan, Evan, you guys were at my wedding. You remember my dad's name, don't you? Uh, is his uh, name Dave? Yep. <laughs> oh, maybe it's your dad. <laughs> Evan is by far the best friend we have, right? Like, <laughs> way funnier than anyone else. So when someone said Dave Crisco here, I'm like, are these psychopaths actually going in on my family now? Because some of the shit they've pulled off my social media before, I could see it. I want to like, say no, but I'm not confident. Oh, my God. That threw me right off for a few seconds there. So I assume there was a Dave Crisco who played in the NHL at some point, which is actually kind of neat. And I got to let yeah. my dad know that. Yeah, it's not spelled the same, but it's there. Oh, the spelling's uh, different. That's probably yeah. why I've never stumbled across it before. Uh, Jersey time. Top three Jersey matchups of the play in series. Stay fresh cheese bags and stay someone else. Brad or whatever your actual name is. Uh, um, their real jerseys not going to any alternatives they've worn. I think the only answer here is Pittsburgh, Montreal. Yeah, um, that's good. 
the if you were allowed to take their heritage classic game then i choose calgary winnipeg uh calgary winnipeg if you're allowed to use those that's the right answer i like chicago edmonton i think that's a strong jersey matchup um i don't know like I, arizona now has the kachina so that they said they're wearing up. them right yeah yeah but nashville jerseys are very Meh, meh for me. Yeah, but I, I don't take Islanders Panthers over them. I don't no, take definitely Canucks not. Wild. Uh Canucks Wild. Canucks Wild yeah. is not bad, actually. That's an underrated jersey series. Leafs jackets doesn't do it for me. I wish I liked the Hurricanes jerseys more, because at least they would get the Rangers right there. in there. Yeah, this isn't this there's like go one Yotes. team that ruins every one of them. I go Yotes just for Kachina. Yeah, they're wearing the Kachina, so that helps. And Nashville's jerseys aren't bad. They're just they're fine. They're, yeah, they're all right. James Phoenix. James, welcome. Says, well, now as the newly crowned Patreon, uh, Patreon member and as one of your first overseas meetup advocates, I firstly just want to say thanks for keeping all of us sane during this offseason. And with the draft ranking mere uh, draft lottery mere days away now, the anticipation of possibly being able to select Ramuski's finest finally begins to become a reality. In homage to uh, Hakan Anderson being a part Brit Swede stroke newly crowned Australian citizen and his continuing ability to be able to pull European shaped diamonds from the rough in later rounds, notably Thomas Holmstrom, arguably one of the most understated and intelligent players to net front given how he played with the Euro Twins as a 10th round pick in 94 and Zetterberg as a 7th rounder in 99. Following your profile on Daniel uh, Torgerson last episode, who is one of my later dark horse dark uh, draft dark horses until that cat was truly left out of the bag. Who are each of your sleeper value picks with the wings potential third and fourth round picks? Oh. Anyways, lad, keep up the great work and all the best from over the pond. Okay, let me pull up my draft rankings here. So basically, all I'm going to do is pick guys that I currently have ranked in the second round that are pretty much not ranked in the second round anywhere else uh yeah that's first the kind one of that, thing yeah first one that comes to mind for me it's he's not a european but zaid wisdom and kingston it's for a uh, name actually yeah i'm gonna stick with kingston for both of these answers i'm gonna go zaid with zaid wisdom and martin chromiak i'm gonna i think they're most rankings i see have the mid to late second round uh sorry chromiak mid to late second round wisdom third or fourth round I really like both of them. And it's, I, I think a big reason why Shane Wright uh, beat Connor McDavid's 15 year old scoring stats in the O is because uh, of Wisdom and Chromiak. I, I think they were that good that they, they propped right up even more than he would have on his own. And he's d disgustingly good. So <laughs> that's saying a lot. I'm going to steal a page from Brad's book here. Um, Brad has advocated for this player for a little while, which got me to kind of double back and watch more about him because um, I kind of brushed him off as a possible pick because of the position he played. But Nico does. I mean, you're not drafting Yaroslav Askarov and goaltenders can go early or late. There's no real rhyme or reason to when they go besides teams kind of getting weird about it. Um yeah, he's he's touted as one of the best goaltending prospects in this draft outside of Askarov, or even including Askarov. Like he's not he's not ranked first, but he's not ranked too far behind him. Um, but there's a chance he doesn't go until late. So if the Red Wings are able to snag him in the third or fourth, goalies are voodoo. I would never bet on this, but hey, maybe Dawes pans out and there's your goalie of the future. And so complete dark horse like absolutely everything would have to go right including even having the opportunity to draft him but i i wouldn't be um that would kind of be my pick if you're gonna put a gun to my head so funny funny thing about nico dawes is i right now am willing to not bet but i i got a strong feeling that if the red wings don't take him at 32 they won't get him because when you look through a lot of the top ranked goalies for this draft so you go into the second third fourth rounds I think Nico Dawes is the only one over six one, and you've and in the NHL now there are very few goalies under like six two six three who who become truly successful. So, if size is an important part of your goalie evaluation, yeah, Dawes might be like your only option past Askarov. For me, it's um, the only guy I noticed who is any good on the North Bay Battalion this year. Um, and it is Brandon Co. He's big. He plays on literally the worst team in the OHL. 
Uh, I think he led or was close to leading them in scoring. And if he was on any better team, he would be way higher on the draft board. Um, so uh, he'll be available in the third round. And if you're looking to swing, he's big, gritty. He'll take the puck to the net and he knows how to score. So he could be a good value pick. Um, Dead Panda Society says, is it better to, uh, to live to eat or eat to live? Also, if you could only eat one type of food for the rest of your life, what would you all choose? Hashtag join the lawsuit. Hashtag Brad's name is Dave. Eat to live or live to eat. I love food. I'm going to go live to eat. Yes. Uh, I like food a little too much. I very much have the mindset and try to live by the lifestyle of eat to live. But yeah, that doesn't always work out. Yeah. If you're trying to get in the gym and really bulk out and, and do it in a way that it's going to make you look halfway decent in front of a mirror. You kind of have to transition to uh, eat to live, which just gets depressing after a little while. I was I was admittedly doing great on it. And then the quarantine just ruined everything. Also, your your second small child. You know what? It's not even Hank that's ruining my eating. It's the older Mika gets, the more I don't know how to phrase this normal. She eats like she just eats people meals people food at people times not like hank who's on like yeah, baby mush so now we have to buy food for three years <laughs> we have to buy mika like snacks because she's a kid and every kid should have snacks but then there are snacks in the house i see them they're I your them. snacks they are now my snacks i don't buy chips for that reason oh before, that's over for me before kids that was my entire motto like we just crystal and i we just kept the crap out of the house because we have zero self-control to not eat that stuff just don't even put it in the house and it was it was great mika screwed everything up uh one type of food for the rest of my life i don't know that's a tough like I, there's nothing i like so much that i could say yes definitively this is the food i will eat only like i love poutine but after a week of it i'd want to die like i love you pizza. would probably no you know, i probably would uh, I'll go pizza, but it's if I got to be able to change the toppings and I also got to be able to just throw up relentlessly some days. Something that's super dynamic like pizza could work. It could. But like, I are you eating the same type of pizza every time or do you get to like change the toppings at will? Because that's kind of cheating. This. We're not doing this because I want to go to bed at some point. Today. No, I'm not. I don't even care what toppings you put on it. But if you get to like change the toppings constantly, that's kind of cheating. I'll it's still pizza. No, I'll assume that it, you can get different toppings on the pizza. He said type of food. I'm not going broad. I'm not saying like Chinese food and then you you can just live forever off of a normal cuisine. But I'll, I'll go down as specific as pizza, but say we can switch the toppings. Oh, man, I am. This is tough for me because like the healthy side of me wants to pick like a, a healthy meat that I can like. So like steak would be the obvious answer. And you could do that a million ways. Um, but like part of me goes. Yeah, but Reese peanut butter cups are a thing. Yeah. And the rest of my life. <laughs> That's fair, man. <laughs> Evan Beckner says, hey, guys, did you know since the current draft lottery system was put in place? Oh, my God, really? Since the current lottery system was put in place, 12th and 13th pick or uh, 12th and 13th place in the draft lottery have won at a higher rate than second and third. Oh, bite me. I don't want to know. Ah. That. <laughs> I don't want it. And you know what? That is just going to be my argument anytime someone tries to justify this current lottery system. At That's least we have my whole right. argument. To distract you from that slightly depressing news, I sent you pictures of my puppy I just got. His name is Finn. Finn is cute as hell, and he is the newest honorary mascot of the Winged Wheel podcast. Um, best of luck. He looks like he has a mile of energy a minute. Puppy pictures always encouraged. Yeah. YBK says, "Howdy, my favorite trio of dingbats. Who knows what the f uh, who knows what the furk about COVID nineteen anymore? Streets are burning in the U.S. and best Korea's leader or his sister, depending on which conspiracy theory you believe, blew up a diplomatic building. Twenty twenty is really trying to write itself into the history books, isn't it? I was listening to another pod a few days ago. Um, uh, da, 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 red draftables on the ringer." Um, 
at Q Evan, no free ads. And there's a little anecdote made up by one of the uh, hosts that was interesting. He asked the GM, what skill do you believe can never, you can never have enough of on a basketball team? And the GM instantly, instantly replied shooting. Keep in mind, this was in 07. So it was before the dizzying three point revolution that overtook the NBA in the 2010s. In that same vein, if you were to select one skill that a team can never have enough of, what would it be? I'm pretty interested in Ryan's opinion as well as Brad's. If Evan can muster the strength to listen to these damn questions, his input would be appreciated as well. What? All right, Evan, you're going first. What skill would can a single team or can a team not have enough of? And we're talking specific skills, so we can't just sit here and say hockey IQ as a cop out answer, right? No. Offensive no. instincts. <laughs> um, if it has to be like a more granular level. Um, I guess I think at the level of like shooting, skating. Yeah. Passing. Yeah. Well, you got to be able to shoot, skate, pass to score, right? Well, you don't have to be able to skate. Um, no, I'd say, you know what? The way the NHL is going, you have to have a team full of good skaters. There's very few teams that get away with just parking one player on the left side on the power play and scoring almost a thousand goals. So I'll say skating. Do you know what goes faster than a good skater? The puck. Give me a team full of elite passers. Oh, oh wow. So some so you want some filpulas. I you can you can create offense with people who can't shoot very well if they're in the right spot to score all the time. I'll, I'll and, take your Quinn teammate, Hughes. and your te- teammates can get you the puck there. You know the you most know what Connor McDavid's really good at? Skating. You know what Quinn Hughes is really good at? Skating. Do you know, you know what, what else they're really good at? Passing. And Crosby. I didn't Look, think we'd have three different answers to this. I, and Passing is the most efficient way to get the puck around the ice and to the areas you want. I, my, my answer was skating. And I, just by a hair, I'm going to pivot over to scoring. Like a shooter. Like if you have, if you have a bunch of high end to elite shooters on your team, if you have, if they're average skaters, or you do not get as many like offensive zone starts or entries or offensive zone time. It doesn't matter if you're more efficient with it. If you're going to put that puck in the net more often, what do you need to do to win a hockey game? You need to have more goals than the other team. Yes, but uh, after the chase, uh, playing against elite goalies, I don't think taking elite shooters just clapping from the half wall and the blue line is going to go in a lot. You got to get this to is a bit of a rock, chase. paper, scissors thing. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's if it wasn't shooting, it was going to be skating. And even then, like. Oh, me passing was third? Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Who even asked you? You know what? I picked up... I I thought that was a Brad answer. I was thought I thought I was stealing your answer. Nope. Oh, no. I'm becoming Brad and Brad... No, I can't do this. I can't be the only Brad. It sounds like a nightmare. Uh, they want to say, stay safe, gentlemen, especially you, Brad, not just from COVID, but from the screams of children at night. Seriously, my five-year-old just began screaming at night when he's tired, and it's not a good thing for anybody involved. <laughs> Oh, Mika had her first like true and utter meltdown on Monday night. And that was an experience, Um, but it's canceled by the good moments. Uh, Hank said his first word like two hours ago. So that was fun. What do you think his first word is going to be protein because he is a freaking monster. That dude's huge. Yeah, we've been calling him tanky. That's been his kind of like nickname from the rest of us. What was his first word? Mum. Well, that's boring that's a harder one too mom yeah mika dad dad was mika's first yeah oh, yeah mika get it mika rc tendy says i watched all the episodes of the winged wheel they totally copied off you guys that is the uh, red wings um youtube series about uh last season which they just put up i haven't had a chance to watch it yet either way i really liked it they highlighted the growth and maturation of the kids and how they're they are the foundation going forward and i'm hoping they do more episodes for it and possibly a recap every season hopefully if we keep a positive uh, attitude about all of this rad good things will come to us in the draft even if we don't win the first pick nothing says in stone that lafreniere will be the best player three to five years from now okay hatrick swayze dope name Says Hatrick Swayze here. Been listening since November 2019. New Patreon supporter. Hey, Hatrick, thank you so much. And again, great name. I enjoy the content, humor, speculation, and insight in the rare occasion that Evan seems genuinely engaged. Again, Brad, we need to find some kind of way to just shoot that guy up with adrenaline before each podcast because nothing has a better efficiency of making listeners happy than when Evan speaks. <laughs> um, that being said, based on your guys' observations, do you think Dylan Larkin is truly an elite center? 
My non-Red Wings fan buddy thinks he's overrated. Buddy's team will probably lose Jack Eichel before the end of the summer, so what does he know? Looking to hear your input on where Lark stands against other centermen in the league, and what do you guys expect from him as the years progress? I know his sample size is relatively limited considering this team in recent years. So to me, elite means a guy who's like top 10 to 15 at his position in the entire league. So by my definition, no, Larkin is not elite. Um, I, two years ago, if you asked me if Dylan Larkin was even a number one center, I would have said no. Now I will can, I will agree that Larkin is a number one center in the NHL and a, a very good one at that. But I wouldn't go so far as to say elite. Yeah, I think. That's the right answer there. Like we were saying like Larkin, you know, objectively on paper, despite being the Red Wings number one center is probably more of a true, like very good second line center. And and he's shown up in a lot of ways to prove that, no, he can be uh, and often is a viable, good first line center in this league. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's elite. I think elite is very limited. I think you save elite for you know, not only like the Connor McDavid's, but you're looking at like the the Tavares of the NHL, like the the top end centers who they're they're almost game breaking. Like they they should be superstars or close, and I don't think Larkin's there. And that's not a knock on him. The center is the most important position on the ice, outside of when a goalie takes over a game. And to be elite at the most important position on the ice, it's a very small handful of people. Uh, they go on to say, Ryan, hit me up when you need someone to carry you on NHL 20 clubs. I will need carried. So thank you. And I will take you up on that. Stay fresh, begged cheese. Much love. Hattie. Joseph Delia says, sup my dudes. I have a dumb slash silly question for you guys before you roll your eyes, Brad. It's not the Mantha Montreal BS. Buffalo calls you and offers you, uh, Jackie Ikes. Could you get a deal done without offering up Larkin? I don't want to get my feelings hurt trading him or the top four pick this year. Probably not. Right. So if Buffalo offers Jack straight up for the pick, what draft position would accept the trade? Would what draft position would accept the trade? Thanks, guys. Any Anything? pick but one. Yeah. Yeah. And and I don't even think twice on it. No. It, uh, yeah. No. With Byfield, you're hoping Byfield turns into someone with Jack Eichel's impact. With Lafreniere, you have a chance at a guy who could be so special that everyone in the country knows his name. Like I'm uh, not even gonna sit here and say. For sure, Lafreniere will be better than Eichel, but this is where you got to factor in that. I'm pretty confident that Lafreniere will at least get in Eichel's, uh, we'll call it stratosphere, his range. Um, But Lafreniere is six years younger, five years younger. Jack Eichel had anyone to play with. Man, he'd be over 100 points every single year. The points would come way easier than they are now. Yeah, I maybe. Uh, yeah, I would still I'd say number two and down. In terms of getting a deal done without this year's pick and Larkin, I think you could easily could. You know, you have Zadina, Cider, Valeno, and then multiple firsts after that to work with. I mean, I said you would be impossible to trade Eric Carlson and look how that turned out. And then look how that turned out. So. <laughs> Um, I don't think it would be like a, a, a ridiculous where you're giving up Zadina, Cider, and multiple first, but I think you're probably giving up Zadina and Cider, or you're giving up Zadina and uh, first and another good prospect, but it, it it would hurt. Like, it would hurt it's the a players big we would have to get up. Darren Helm Stan Club says, hey guys, new patron. Had to learn how to use Patreon just so I can get on here and support y'all. Love the content. Thank you so much, Darren Helm Stan Club, and you will fit in well here. <laughs> <laughs> a few weeks ago after the end of the season press conference, you guys discussed who could get the C next year, and you forgot the one and only Darren Helm. After a moment of confusion, I realized it's been a while since we've seen hockey. Maybe it's possible we're all going crazy. I know it's been discussed at times, but looking at the Wings' older veterans, what's the timetable for each of them going forward as a team is getting younger thanks for keeping our minds on potentially brighter days as we navigate this crazy world number 43 forever um like timetable as to how long the red wings are just playing the league in general uh i'm assuming that will be synonymous for a lot of them uh Uh, justin abdulkader i don't think will survive a full next season i don't know if like unless there's a rash of injuries i don't know if he plays a game uh (laughs) this season i think franz nielsen will get the same treatment in a year or two. I just don't know if the Red Wings can stomach having over $9 million in the AHL. Um, 
Who are the other veterans? I think DeKaiser rides out his full contract. I think Philp was done after his second year. Yeah, I agree. I could see Nemeth getting re-signed. I could see him uh, absolutely. Oh, he's 28. Get, yeah, I could see him sticking around for another four or five uh, years. Uh, I think Helm's gone at the deadline this year as much as you don't want to hear that, but he will have trade value because he's one of the few veterans on the Red Wings who's not useless, but he does have an expiring contract. Um, so he, uh, he might argue, arguably be air quotations, the most valuable Red Wing this year, because he's <laughs> probably going to net us the biggest return at the deadline. So if Darren Helm is not moved and he sees the end of his contract, I could see him getting brought on league minimum for a year. After. I could see him getting not quite the Philpola contract, if that makes sense. Maybe two years, but probably closer to one and a half, two million a year instead of three. But again, if you're Darren Helm, do you accept that contract on a rebuilding team? I would say no. I would say yes if I'm Darren Helm because I don't know who's paying me more. I would at least try to find out. <laughs> Where's Ken Holland again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Edmonton doesn't have a lot of forward depth. Uh, Jake Nagy says, who in your mind is the most ideal line mate currently on the Wings roster for the following players? Lafreniere. Larkin. Um, Larkin. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Byfield, Mantha. I'm just going to Z- pick the best center or the best winger on the team for all of this. <laughs> Zadina. Um, Stutzla. Zadina. Rossi. Mantha. Mantha. And Raymond. Larkin. Yes. C-Nod says, hey, guys, what is a hockey prediction that you're most proud was validated? Mine was talking to some Blues fans when they were a dumpster fire and saying as soon as they have any goalie besides Allen between the pipes, they will be cup contenders. On the opposite side, what has one that has blown up in your face? For me, I was way too much on the Tampa hype train, but chaos is way more fun than being right. Great pod, guys. Cheers, C-Nods. Um, one that I was one of my worst was um, – thinking that DeKaiser would be a top four defenseman in his entire career. And, you know, we all know how that's gone. Um, what's one that we got right? Oh, there's a big spider dropping right in front of me. Don't like that. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to take this same theme on both these. Uh, there were two Red Wings prospects that I was banging the drum for feverishly before <laughs> everybody else. And uh, they were Gus Nyquist and Thomas Yerko. So, 50-50 on that one. (laughs) What hockey prediction did I get right? Uh, I don't feel good about this one. I don't feel good about this one at all. And I don't think we were necessarily the only ones to do it. People who are watching on YouTube are just looking at me, look straight at the ceiling because I'm not losing sight of the spider. Um, We talk about early years of this podcast. We had to tone down our talk about like the impending doom of the Red Wings when we started this podcast because they were at the tail end. The the, the first year we started was the last year they made the playoffs. No, we um, had we've covered two playoff series on this podcast. Two playoffs. Yes, two playoffs. And uh we said like this is gonna go downhill soon and it might be better to rebuild now, otherwise this is gonna be an ugly, ugly rebuild. And then you saw the Abdulkader contract and you saw the DeKaiser contract and we took a lot of like when we were a smaller podcast, like we took a lot of crap and we were like worried. We're like, are people going to stop listening? So we had to tone down the you know discussion on <laughs> the impending Red Wings rebuild because all this fan base has known a success. And uh, yeah, not one that I'm happy that we're right about, but it's on there. Uh, uh, another one I'm going to take small credit for is uh, before his breakout season this year, I was arguing that Mantha might be the best player on the Red Wings. And people said I was a heretic for even implying it might not be Larkin. I think you're being dramatic. Oh, no, you've seen those Twitter conversations. You participated in them, you a-hole. Yeah, Brad, I will unilaterally participate in anything that riles you up. You know what's riling me up? I lost the spider. (laughs) Oh, God. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. You're in his house now. No way to see that thing crawling on the wall behind you. Can you? <laughs> and with that, we're uh, let's let's wrap up this episode. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, thank you for everyone who's been submitting iTunes reviews. Um, has not gonna notice you guys. That means so much. Like, what a five star review does for us is, uh, 
I can't even say enough. So thank you so much. Um, like to thank all of our listeners, our name level sponsors on Patreon, Andrew Bohan, Arjun Shanker, Brad Smith, Brandon M., Brendan Geldof, Charlie Elkins, Clayton Van Dyke, and Dead Panda Society, Hannah Lee, Hassam al Jacob Turner, Jake Kiefer, Jeremiah Dobo, Kaylin Wood, Luke Johnson, Matt McKay, Matthew M. Rice, Greach, Scott Martin, Alex Ott, Antonio Gracias, Chris Frank, Connor Leighton, Danny Jr., John Evans, Josh Rosnowski, Kay Waz, Matthew Keeler, Simon Anderson, Stan Olson. Thank you all. We love you. And if I survive this spider... I will see you. We will see you on Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.